Pat's funny. He had everything, this man. And you did a fine impression of him. Well, I did. I used to, as a kid, of course, the, I grew up loving Gary Sobers. Yeah. And uh, he, used to, he was the first sportsman ever to have the old collar turned up. Mm. And he had a sort of strange sort of walk, a sort of hippie, casual, sort of th just basically loose. He just sort of yeah. slithered onto the pitch. So after the interview, I don't know why, but I he was of, walking out the he was walking. I was walking behind him, and he was still got the walk. Yeah. And so I started doing the walk. And, and then I caught the eye of his publicist looking at me. I thought, yeah. I felt a bit stupid. She but, didn't you know, mind, did she? She didn't mind. She said, that's a very good impersonation. She did, yeah. You should see it. Made I, did turn the, I did the rest of the book to her. I did all the signings. <laughs> and anyway, uh, this is uh, Gary Sobers. You, you go straight in with the book, and you're talking... I, I didn't realise this, nor did Andy, and he knows a fair bit about you, having been a real hero of his, that you were born with two extra fingers. Oh, well, yeah. Um, I mean, most, well, a lot of people will know that, unless they knew me when I was very young. Yes, yes. I was, but the, the fingers were not really... There were little things hanging from the side. It wasn't it like having fingers stick out at one was side. It, was it like this? Because recently there was a, a baseball pitcher in America. We were talking about this about two weeks ago. This guy, and this yeah. chap had a similar... And when Paul mentioned this to me this morning, I said, I wonder if it was like that. But what, I can't really see what... Yes, little, yes, it was that. Similar. One at the top. Similar. Tiny the one at the finger. bottom. Yeah. So there was no... Was there any kind of... You took them off in a fairly brutal kind of way, didn't you? When you removed them. I don't know what you call brutal. Um, <laughs> well, a one, piece of cat gut wrapped around the base <laughs> and a sharp tug. I've taken a tooth out. Well, one, one fell down. Off, um, that, but um, they always uh, deaden the place. They don't just do them like it sound like you make it sound. <laughs> <laughs> Might have been good for the extra finger. I don't know. Probably in the wrong place. That, I don't know much about that. <laughs> <laughs> it probably got in the way. <laughs> but we, the catches as well, I would think. Absolutely. Now, we ought to explain to some of the younger listeners. I mean, the, not only. I mean. You were a unique all-rounder, probably, in my opinion, the best all-rounder cricket has ever seen. I mean, you probably would have been good enough to make it just as a batsman, probably good enough to make it just as a fast bowler. But not only did you do that, you were a great spin bowler, you had two different types of spin, and you were a great fielder. How did it, when did it occur to you that all, you had all this ability to do these various different things? Well, you know, as a, as a youngster growing up, you try everything. As a matter of fact, I tried whatever I could because... I always wanted to be in the game, and if it means that I had to bowl a certain type of bowling to try and get wickets, I'd do that, you know, I'll give it a try. Hmm. Um, there's nothing wrong with trying things, and we played a lot of various types of cricket. Um, we used to play a game called, what we called firms, and firms was a game that you, you get the ball, you bowl it. You catch the ball, you bat. That kind of thing. Mm. So um, you play those kind of games, and there's no sense bowling spin, because if you bowl the spin, and somebody catch him, you're out. So you learn to bowl fast and try and knock the wickets over, which wasn't easy because it was not LBW decisions. Yeah. So mm. the batsman will not let you bowl him down. He will get in front of the stumps and it was with a tennis ball. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to hurt him. So you couldn't frighten him. But you had to learn to bowl fast and bowl clever. Move the ball to try and get him out. So you learn to bowl fast. And um, then after you do that, you, you find that there are a lot of players, young players that we used to play with, can play fast bowling. But they weren't very clever when you bowl spin. Mm. So you work those players out and you thought, well, when he comes in, I will try and learn how to bowl spin. So you learn how to bowl spin against those, ki those kind of players. Because there were some, you the faster you bowl, the harder they hit you. <laughs> but as soon as you bowl slow, they got all confused. So you learn to, to get to know the players and you learn to bowl what you think was the best to bowl on that uh, at that time against that particular player but you, you you'd sort of kept it going right through to the you know a lot, you'd expect a lot of people to try different things when they were young but to keep it going right at the top level was pretty rare wasn't it yeah well you know if you learn it and you as keen as i was you know i, I was very keen in cricket and you know i didn't like to stand up being idled uh, somewhere waiting for somebody else to come on and bowl so i just thought you know if i can bowl all these different ways the captain must call on me sometime if he wants <laughs> spin true. you have to call on me to bowl <laughs> spin if you think i'm good enough and if you want somebody to bowl a little bit of pace i can do that too so it means that i always had the opportunity that was there for the captain to say you know come and do this mm. you know if you didn't have all these different things the captain when he finished with you as a fast bowler that's it you know but um he's still had the idea in his back as well, you know, Gary can spin, you know, so I'd give him a little, and I was pleased, I used to love that. You made the point in the book as well that um, playing with a tennis ball was important, and a lot of players of your generation improved their batting and learned to play off the back foot more because they were using a soft ball. Yeah, well, tennis ball was a, was, was a thing that you played with because growing up as youngsters, you couldn't afford a cricket bat, 
You couldn't afford a hard ball. You couldn't afford pads mm. and gloves and all those things. So to play the game and to play of any starter and to get to, to, to love it, you played with the tennis ball. Mm. Even that you couldn't afford. You go and beg the, 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 um, the people that played tennis or the boy who used to feel the balls mm. at the tennis court. You'd ask him to get an old ball for you and you go and pass by somebody, um, Palisade, and you pull one of the... <laughs> um, things, one of the um, palisades out, yeah, mm. and you make a bat out of it, <laughs> and you go and you and you play with it, and you go and scratch broken bats as well now and again, wouldn't you? Well, you used to do that particularly when you you, you know, cause I used to be around the Wonders Cricket Club where mm. Roy Marshall and Norman Marshall and Dennis Atkinson and those fellows played, and um, they're like me today. I used to go and bowl at them when I was 15, 12, and 13 years of age. And if they had a broken bat, I'd beg them for it. You know, but that was a bat to play a thing called Lily Pushin. Mm. We used to cut it in half. The Lily Pushin was a game that was played, you know, on um, a wicket half the size of a full-length wicket, and you kneel on one knee, and the bowl a ball on the ha on their arm, and then uh, sometimes they'll bowl on their arm, but they had to kneel down. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was created because of space. Yeah, Harry you know. Pilling would have been good at that. <laughs> he was very good, you know, he played against Harry, he played against Harry when he used to bowl like spin. Mm. When he first started in the league about 12 or 13 years of age, playing for Oldham. And he was pretty good as a leg spinner. But, you know, all these, oh, these games were created because we all love cricket. And we live in areas where there wasn't much room between the houses. Mm. And if you, you, you play in the road, but you had to be keep moving because you had to keep moving because of the cars. Mm. Cars keep coming up and down and interrupting your cricket. So you didn't like that too much. <laughs> so you played between the houses where there wasn't much space. So you played this lily pushing game. Yeah. What well, brilliant! Scarf and Service is with us <coughs> in the studio, and um, we're allowed to call him Gary. There we are. Thanks. Thanks. Look, next half hour certainly we can. Now England played a very important part in your in your career and your development as a cricketer. You would that in the book, don't you? Well, yeah, from the point of view that um, I came to England uh, when I was at the age of about 20 and I played when I came with the West Indies in 1957 and then I came back on every year after that and played in the league, which was an, an experience for me, you know, playing on the English conditions, which was very good because it it helped you because the wickets were so far so far different to the mm. wickets in anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, once you learned to play on those wickets, it was really um, an education and it was really something that you enjoyed because you, 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 you just couldn't go there and play shots. You just had to concentrate on what you was doing. The ball would do something nearly all the time. Mm. So it wasn't just like um, probably in the West Indies or in India or other places where after the new ball, the shine is off, the ball just doesn't do anything until it gets later on when the wickets start to deteriorate. But in England, with the greenness on the wicket, you know, bowlers who were even great bowlers would yeah. come up and bowl and yet they'd get something to happen. So it helped you to concentrate. Um, help you to learn to play the moving ball, mm. help your technique to develop. So it did, yes. They were uncovered in those days as well, weren't they? So that made it even more tricky. Yeah, well, we, we were uncovered in the West Indies too, which was even more difficult. Mm. Because, uh, a wet wicket in the West Indies is far more difficult than a wet wicket in England. And because you weren't um, resident here, you had to be resident for two years to play proper county cricket. So you were playing for, in the Central Lancashire League, weren't you, from Ratcliffe, was it? Yeah, started? I started in the Central Lancashire League playing for, as they say, Ratcliffe. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> and how was that? Did you enjoy it? That was very enjoyable. Um, the one thing I didn't enjoy too much is that when I went there, I was only about 21, and they wanted me to coach. And I find after a few months, um, trying to coach fellows who were in the 30s and 40s mm. were a little bit difficult for me to talk to them and to tell them what I wanted them to do. Sure. So I had asked the committee and the club to relieve me from the coaching because I felt a little bit um, embarrassed mm. trying to talk to these um, elderly players and I just come into cricket myself. Yeah. You know, so they relieved me from that. I was able then to concentrate and relax and just go and play my cricket. Mm. The thing that amazed me most is that that you started out, uh, although you're, you're known as a great all-rounder, you started out batting nine, didn't you? When you played, was it your first test match you batted yeah, nine? Yeah, I was never, I didn't start as a batsman, I was no, a bowler. Exactly, yeah. You know, um, the only problem with that is that um, people thought I was a batsman, and <laughs> people keep referring back to me when they see other players who are batsmen, hmm. and come into the team as a batsman, and don't get a hundred 
And at a certain time, they keep saying, well, Gary Sorbert didn't get 100 till his 25th innings or his, his 10 test matches or 12 or whatever it is, you know, which has no bearings at all to a player who goes in as a player, as a, as a batsman, you know, because I was picked for the West Indies team in 1954 as a bowler. And as you so rightly said, mm -hmm. I batted at number eight, at number nine, just before a chap called um, Frank King and Sonny Ramadan, mm -hmm. you know, so I wasn't picked as a batsman. You know, my batting developed, although I knew that I could bat, yeah. um, I was sent down there, and my batting in um, friendly cricket or in even club cricket is far different than batting in test cricket. Sure, yeah. You know, you may be a batsman at the level of um, a first-class game like you have here in, in London or mm -hmm. a league player, mm -hmm. but when you go to test cricket, <laughs> your bat batting would probably if you bat number three in, in probably your league team as a yeah. local fella, you probably bat at number eight or nine in a mm. test team if you make it. Yeah. So yeah. I wasn't really a, a batsman, you know, but I um I worked on it. I worked on it. And you went on to score that. you went on to make the record test score, didn't you? Three sixty five was it? Three sixty four. I got lucky. You got <laughs> lucky. But of course there was that wonderful moment when Brian Lara broke your record and you went out, didn't you, and to the wicket and and I can't remember exactly did you congratulate yeah, you did. You you went something shook his hand, yeah. Yeah, because records, that records never I never worried about records, setting or breaking records. My whole idea was playing as a team member and to play for the team. That was important, not what I scored or what I didn't. You know, mm -hmm. once I scored enough runs that could help the team, I was quite happy to get out. It wasn't necessary to stick around and to just play. Driver. You know, mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. because um, the team is the important factor. Mm -hmm. um, and when you have done your best at that level and playing for the team, mm -hmm. then that's it. Uh, you know, and I, n I never went on. And breaking a record, the one thing about it that we won the test match. Yeah, we didn't draw it, or we didn't lose. We won it, hmm. you know, and that was important to me that um, I got this big score, and we were still able to declare, in which we m missed an hour in the evening, and we were still able to bowl out the team because we still had a day to go. It wasn't that I um, went in and batted and got this record at the death limit of the team. No. You know, the same thing when I hit the six sixes, it was similar, you know, we won the match. And that again, I mean, <clears throat> something, thank goodness there were some cameras there that day. I was reading the serialization of the, that part in the Times last week, and I didn't realize that the, the BBC Wales weren't going to show that over. And then they did, because it, it wouldn't have had the same impact, would it, if there hadn't been those grainy black and white photos no, it was that people it. have seen so often? No, I think it was due to um, Wolf Waller. The man they called the Mayor of Glamorgan, I think, that he was on at the time, and he decided that he, he would stay on for a few minutes, even before the over started, because I'd just gone in, and after I hit the first six, nothing happened, and mm. then the second. He said, hold on, <laughs> when I hit the fourth six, he said, we're not leaving. <laughs> and I think BBC was quite happy to stay on yeah. to get that, because that is history, and it was, in, it was history in the making. And they stayed on, and they were lucky to get it, you know, and then we even had an interview after, so... It was good from that point of view. The proof they were different times as well is that when you hit the 6-6, six, six, the ball went out the ground, a, a, some young lad found it and he gave it back. He didn't try to sell it back, he gave it back to the club, didn't Yeah, they? these days would be different. That, yeah. was, that was a story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but also differently was, was Malcolm Nash's reaction, because a lot of people sort of felt sorry for him, but actually he, he came up to you, didn't he, afterwards? And, and wasn't too upset. Wasn't that upset? No. Um, Malcolm was smiling up more than I was because I remember after I'd done this, I hit the six sixes, we were asked to go across the ground and go up to up this rostrum into this um, commentator's booth mm. um, to have an interview. And as we were walking across, Malcolm was smiling and I just said to him, you know, um, Malcolm, what are you smiling at? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you been bowling, you would have been smiling. <laughs> you? Hey, well, you don't expect many people would be smiling at <laughs> like that. No. And he looked at me and he says, um, I want you to remember, you couldn't have done nothing. <laughs> 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 you know, um, there we are, Andy, one of your heroes. Yep, and he didn't disappoint. Great no, to meet him. It was great to meet him, wasn't it? Anyway, back in the...